I've been an expert witness in a case where it was a single shot cervical epidural injection. Somebody who had a fusion above and fusion below. And from the first injection, just a small volume. Patient got two, three weeks, pretty good pain relief. And the pain came back. This time the doctor did another epidural steroid injection. And post-procedure, um, the patient had pain going down because I could see the dye going down underneath the surgical fusion below. And in three weeks, that patient had pain, pain changed to numbness and changed to weakness of the arm. And uh, there was a syrinx form, a fluid filled cavity in the spinal cord in three weeks. That was again, again, that you wouldn't know about. What would you recommend to that patient? And any of your patients you inject in the epidural space is you flex and rotate. And once you open up the venous runoff, you get rid of the pain. Because, and you, when you, then the dura moves up and down, it distributes the fluid, it moves lower down and up and down, up and down and less pressure unless you have more blood or fluid coming. And when you inject hypertonic saline, 10 cc I usually inject in the lumbar epidural space or and uh, transsacral trans cases, put in 10 cc of contrast. But first I put a tiny amount in and like to see it spread. But if the patient says, oh, it hurts, I stop before I get one cc. You feel your way and your catheter is going to be in the ventral lateral epidural space. Because, and if, the, if one of your colleagues calls you, I have a patient just injected epidural and he's got pain, pain, pain. What do you recommend? Flexion, rotation for the lumbar area, flexion, rotation for the thoracic area, and flexion, rotation in the cervical area. And, and I saved many patients' um, lives and spinal cords because I get often, and if you look in pain practice, the name of the article is collegial communication, was described one patient that they injected between two thoracic fusions and put the catheter there in the, between the two fusions. It got subdural, beautiful pictures. And when you understand it, you understand fluidics, the flow of fluids in the spinal canal. You've got to read that. The Gabor Ratz and, uh, and the doctor friend I played golf with and explained to him. And when he had put a catheter, her younger lady colleague put, put the catheter in a subdural space using a sharp tipped needle. And you see, I, I don't have, first of all, with the new needle, this RX2 today, which has a second stylet and has a funny looking bevel. So you go paramedian and hit the lamina, then you rotate and go further, and then you curve down. You see, if you look at the tip of the uh, needle, it's, there's no sharp end because the way it's cut, your usual tui and other needles, they have a cutting edge. Now you take the stylet out, 
and put the second stylet that goes beyond the tip a millimeter. And now you can rotate it and the catheter will go in the direction that you, you want it to go. And if you want to go to the other side, you can go to the other side. And, or you can put a bend in it. So you, you can get to the ventral epidural space because it has a good torque, you see? And you, you can get to wherever you are trying to go, but you need to know about it, learn about it, and practice on cadavers. And that's what we've been doing. And I've met many, many uh, Egyptian friends that have and for many many countries i had over a thousand doctors visit me for a week or two while i was a professor at texas tech university in lubbock texas and when we had 25 conferences in budapest with, with cadavers and that's where i met Cherie, and she's been a delight and she, thank you, I, thank you, my dear professor. I it, don't remember what she may have said that I examined her, but that yes. I trained her, I examined her, and uh, actually, it's my honor and my privilege. The family came to the award ceremony for her FIPP, and I had to have a picture with the family and the mother, father, yes. and mother. And, no, it was a, a beautiful experience. It's not surprising that what we are doing is contagious. You have to be, once you read the article in Pain Practice, Collegial Communication, and then you Google it, you can get it in 10 seconds because it's index journal and read the article about how we saved the patient was getting a pain in going down the leg and a weakness of the foot. And then all we did was flex and rotate and bend forward and flex and rotate. And the, the pain went away. They did an MRI, it didn't show anything. Then we waited for 12 months and we published a 12 months follow-up on it that you reverse, you save people's lives. On the other hand, I was an expert witness in a, and you might say, oh, it's just a wet tap, but you should not get wet taps because you, when you rotate the needle with a sharp end without blunting it, you can cut the dura. And when you cut the dura, and I was an expert witness defending this doctor. Uh, and they were suing for $60 million mm. because there was a complicated reasons, but we ended up winning it because the doctor who testified against the other doctor, I don't testify against other doctors because I believe that everybody deserves it defense mm -hmm. and no doctor gets up in the morning I'm going to hurt somebody today no 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 you want to help everybody but when you know that what causes the problem you can avoid it better than I mean even the small issue of uh, using blunt or blunted needles are based on non, not just my experience, but I have been in three or 400 cases, 350 to 400 cases of rare events. So that one man's experience, if you have an expert testifying against you, you have to say, what do you base it on? How much experience? Oh, I have my own experience. It's zero because these events are rare. 
but you never start out trying to hurt somebody. It happens because your lack of information, ignorance, it hurts, I know. You nobody's ignorant, I never have any problem. But if you have one and you get a complication out of that, you get a vein and you don't know about flexion, rotation, simple thing, that patient could be one of the other one I was defending the doctor on was that that doctor did a transforaminal small volume injection, but there is no available space there. So when you inject into the epidural space, it is amazing. There is no spare room. So you prevent that by never using a sharp needle when you go into a transforaminal injection. Because when you, when you go a little bit further, get through the membranes into the epidural space, it suddenly compresses the cord and the patient will complain of pain in the bilateral epidural space when you don't have runoff. Now, if you have one-sided pain, that other side pain will come to head once the scar tissue contracts. And amazingly, the new information, a 10-year follow-up on neuroplasty by Ludger Gerdesmeyer from Germany did the prospective randomized double blind placebo controlled comparing epidural catheters in the epidural space and sub sub um, subcutaneous fresh outside the spinal canal and epidural injection with the local steroid hypertonic were better every time in, uh, for the 10 year follow up, uh, and they aimed for the epidural left ventral lateral epidural space. And that was published in Pain Physician this year to the 10 year follow up. The interesting thing is that the patients had less back pain after the hypertonic saline in the epidural space because not because uh, hypertonic saline neurolytic that kills the nerves but it inhibits fibroblasts and it disrupts the structure of the wall of the uh, C fiber tiny non myelinated fibers and they are involved in innovating the spinal structures. And when you disrupt the C fibers by the hypertonic, it takes them 20 some years to recover maximally. That's why we, our patient that I mentioned, the first published case lasted 20, two years of no pain, no back pain. So going back to the scarring triangle. My dear professor, is, I, have, I have some videos I want to, to share with you and to take your opinion upon these videos. These are your videos and your patients. So okay. if you allow me. Yes, yes, just I apologize that we may have to get together to, for me to complete this story because I used up, there's so much information that I need to get across that makes you a safer and a better doctor. Like when you do a neuroplasty, okay, all right.
Here's the examination. You see, you look for numbness on the outside lateral calf. It has a woody numbness. And then you have, a, you have a foot drop or weakness. You see, he cannot lift up the right foot dorsiflexion. He can do it if you don't test for strength, but against resistance, it doesn't work. And it happens when you have scar formation in the epidural here. space. So we come I think that's good. Then you aim for the mid middle middle. It's failed back surgery. A nice angle, you know, not you can't make it. And then, see, I am not doing this procedure, I'm just visiting. In Madrid, Spain. This was so long ago, I don't even remember where, what country it was in. Spain. This was in Spain. Spain, Almost. yeah. Yeah. Rome. Rome. Was it? You see, you, you go superior medial S1, curving down. Superior medial. Superior medial, and you go in. Push it, push it. The second stylet, the white stylet, makes it blunt. You come from S2, and then I rotated it up 90 degrees. Very good. That's good. See, but, but once you feel it, you feel the penetration pop. It's lovely. See, it cannot cut veins and nerves.
So it, it should be learned that since that time that you only rotate 90 degrees. Oh, yeah. So it goes straight up. If you rotate all the way, you see that is at the ventral epidural space. Have a there or and that's what you cannot do because of the scarring. See, it, it, it should, should be curved instead of all the way 90, uh, 180, 180 degrees, just 90 degrees. Then it goes straight up. It will come down to S1. The L5 is opening up. And the scarring triangle is is here. Now we come into the transverse around four. See, if you see, this is stuck down badly. So, so we open up that. So we came in at an angle, curving down and going in superior medial and then change the stylet to the second stylet and rotate just 90 degrees. You see, it will go straight up just you're curving down. As soon as you feel you're in, you put the second stylet and just rotate 90 degrees. You see, what, what you should be seeing, not all, it's 180 degrees, but that once you once you go in just 90 degrees it goes straight up short way at the armpit of the l5 nerve root that's the nerve root comes out and you come up to the level of the l5 nerve root we come up and then 90 degrees you don't see the arrows you see it goes straight up underneath the L5 nerve root. That's where the scarring triangle is, above the disc. The surgeons never look above the disc. They put new discs in and it fails. Artificial disc. It fails. I had a number of patients like that. But <coughs> Germans like to do artificial discs and many of them fail and I had one patient that had um, four or five well have to I can see you move Sherry you see there is the L5 nerve root you come in, sorry, you, you go in like that, and then that little movement, it, it sends it up 
to about there. Now, why is this catheter work? Why does it work? And this is Tomikichi Matsumoto. He's a Japanese professor. He was one of my students. I've been sending emails to him back and forth. And he realized that a tiny catheter, which is made a bit stiffer and it's closed ended, it goes into the scar a little bit bigger catheter. You have a regular size catheter. Just to show you the difference, you see, see. that catheter does not go into the scar. You, you hear me? Yes, yes. Can you see the difference? Mm -hmm. See, that one does not go into the scar. And this one goes into the tissue plane between the scar tissue. Mm -hmm. The versa cat. And it, it, no such a thing as you can't get it, but what's the name? Where is the name? That the Cairo Medical Ahmed Hussein can get it for you. Mm. He, he, is, he is the distributor in your part of the world. We have participants from uh, different parts of the world. We have from India and Pakistan and El Salvador, yeah. not just from Egypt. And anyway, though, but there, there have been, maybe you understand why it takes longer time to talk about different pieces of facts mm. that we learned about because not of my experience, but I am observer. Mm. I notice the movement. I'm looking at the uh, um, neuroplasty I'm doing in the neck because for a C6 radiculopathy and mm. then the um, electrodes that were placed for atypical facial pain, I'm seeing moving. Mm. Now, first, I didn't notice because I'm so focused on getting the catheter to the ventral lateral epidural space. And this has a tremendous impact on what you are doing and not getting the 20 years or three, four, five years results. Mm -hmm. You get, you know, three weeks epidural steroid. You know, lucky epidural uh, spinal stenosis, useless. Mm -hmm. And you get years of relief when you go to the area. And we have more evidence than anybody, including a placebo controlled trial from Goodesbyer. But let, you, you need, you have some questions. Yes, I have several questions from uh, our participants. Um, first, I, I'd like to thank our participants because we are having uh, lots of participants from different parts of the globe, uh, from Egypt, from Pakistan, from Saudi Arabia, from El Salvador, from Romania, from uh, Budapest. So thanks for joining us uh, for this valuable talk by the eminent Professor Gabur Rex. So let's take some questions for 10 uh, minutes.